Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, making the time to come to this talk. My name is Dinesh Dutt. I work at Cumulus Networks. I'm the chief scientist there. Uh, today, the talk is going to be about the consilience of computing and networking. And uh, who am I? I don't have a slide about who am I. Uh, I was at Cisco before Cumulus Networks. I've been at Cumulus Networks uh, the last uh, four years almost. Uh, I was at Cisco before that. I was a fellow at Cisco. I'm one of the architects of the Catalyst 6500, the Nexus 7000, 5000. I'm the co-author on the VXLAN and the Trill Drafts. Uh, Genev, a bunch of stuff. I've done a lot of data center storage and uh, networking in my past. Uh, at Cumulus, however, when I joined Cumulus, I was looking at some doing something different. I wanted to, I, had been, I was tired of doing networking. I had done enough networking all my life. I was pretty much done till Cumulus came along. And uh, I think what uh, we are doing here is interesting, and I hope uh, I can make that case for you. Uh, the talk focus is the data center. So we'll be talking, whatever I say will apply to the data center. My knowledge, while I do I have worked with some of the other uh, sections of the networking, like campus or service provider, this talk is very much focused around the enterprise, so from that perspective. So a long, long time ago, networking and computing diverged, right? There is the two paths completely differentiated. They started at the same spot. I mean, I remember the time when we were using Solaris machines as the routers. Right, they had two NICs or three NICs, and they used to be the routers. But these days, that's not the case anymore, and networking and computing has completely gone astray. And if you go to a networking conference, uh, you don't see anybody talking about hosts at all, very little, except to say that we support VMs and containers. You come to a talk like Lisa, you see very little talk about networking. Most of the talk is focused on hosts and computing and all the stuff, that exciting stuff that's going on there, very little about what networking is going on. And this dichotomy has been bad. And it's caused us to solve every problem twice, right? I mean, networking at the end of the day is a computer exactly like any other network, uh, any other computer is. It just is a special function computer, but it is the same. So why attempt to duplicate the problems twice? But that's what's happened. Let's take a few examples. If you look at the way the hardware packaging is done, the server world, at least in the data center, as I said, it's based on an open standard, right? The PC architecture is well understood. It's been open source for a long time. You have everybody building it, whether it's the mom and pop store at the corner, Dell, HP, uh, Cisco, Every one of them builds, computes. It's disaggregated hardware and software. You can buy the hardware separately and slap on whatever operating system you want on it. That's not the case with networking. Networking is vertically integrated. It's an appliance-oriented model, and it's closed. You essentially buy everything from one vendor. When it comes to software packaging, it's not very different again. In the, in the server world, you've got a couple of packaging solutions like DEB and RPM, and Everybody just works around that. They know how to tool around it. Everybody knows how it works, what it does. There is an upgrade process that's well understood. There are lots of eyeballs on it. And you'll hear me say this a lot. There are, one of the things that you have going on in the compute world is a lot of eyeballs, which means that there is a lot of innovation and there's a lot of change and the ability to do things much more efficiently and in intelligent ways compared to the networking world. In the networking world, it's mostly a binary blob. Even today, even companies like Juniper, which have based on BSD, and they were one of the first people who actually could support upgrades to just single processes, most of them just do binary upgrades. Any, and some of them now, with the new world of uh, DevOps uh, springing up everywhere, some of them are starting to do uh, individual packages, but it's again a proprietary package format. It's not DEB or RPM. Mark Burgess, who some of you may know, once told me, Dinesh, the problem with networking engineers is they think the solution to every single thing ends with protocol. Packaging is not a protocol problem, but because it's constructed in a particular way and thought about it in a particular way, everything is done completely differently. And now you've got a packaging format that comes with a different set of behavior characteristics compared to something that is well understood, which is Debian or RPM. Configuration. 
everybody knows there are just tons of configuration choices, whether it be CLI, whether it be, uh, even if you want to look at Bash or a shell program, you've got tons of shell programs. You've got Ansible, Puppet, Chef, Salt. I mean, there are just tons of them. Compared to that on the, oh, both of them have compute. That's a typo. One of them is uh, networking on the one on the side. Uh, the networking is predominantly still CLI. And there is automation support coming up, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But in general, if you go to a network admin, they are most comfortable with a CLI. And they're not even comfortable automating many times. The ones who are automating, we'll talk about them in a few minutes. On the monitoring side, exactly the same model again. Everything is structured around in the compute world around a whole bunch of choices. There was a talk, just uh, the previous session in the other room, the talk was about how do you build, uh, how do you have ganglia support gathering 30 million or 30 billion statistics a day? Networking is still SNMP. If you can get statistics faster than five minutes a day and you've got a large box, you'd be lucky. Because typically, networking, the SNMP walks kill the networking equipment. The other problem is it's a pull model, uh, right? The central server has to go and pull this data every single time. Anybody who's built a scalable model understands pull is not scalable. It is push that is far more scalable and everybody wants to push. Do some intelligent analysis up front and then push it out. The other thing that you notice very commonly is that just about every vendor has a whole bunch of counters that you can access by typing the CLI command. But if it's SNMP, it is not available at all. And the reason it's not available is a MIB has not been defined. And when the MIB is defined, the world has moved on, and the counters are archaic, and people have found ways to work around the counters. So constantly what you find are patches and workarounds rather than a solution that simply says, look, if I can get the counters, I don't care how. Take something like Calegdi or Ganglia. They have got so many options that they can pull statistics out by running a script and then take the output of the script, convert it into JSON, and push it to a Ganglia server. They don't need every single app to have a model to actually make things work. As long as some counter is supported and I can get the counter, I know how to push it to whatever is the monitoring agent there is. Unlike the networking world where everything is structured around SNMP only today, and you know all the problems that uh, SNMP has. DevOps tools. If you look at the networking, the compute world again, people have all kinds of tools. Puppet, Chef, Ansible to configure, server spec, behave, Cucumber to validate it. You've got distributed key value stores. You, I mean, no SQL databases. Pick the task you want to do, and you've got some very intelligent, active community-led project that is going to answer your choice. Be it from as small as unikernels, the other talk that I was at, or hypervisors, or containers, or applications. All of them have a lot of active-led community. All of this means that there are a lot more people who can contribute. And as more and more people can contribute, the solutions that you get out of it are far more innovative. Whereas if you look at what's happening in the networking world, all the eyeballs on a particular problem is with one company. The DevOps tools don't exist. They may be existent somewhat, but then they are always an afterthought. At Cisco, one of the things we used to always say is we really suck at management. The reason we suck at manage, we used to suck at management is because it was always an afterthought. It was never, SNMP was never designed in from day one because there were standards bodies to go through, there were MIPS to define. By the time everything was done, it just took a lot of time. And we had customers asking for features, so you ship the features displaying the counters via CLI. That's the standard model. And automation is following the same path with the traditional networking vendors. They all have features for the standard stuff. For anything that is new, it is still very much a vendor-driven push model. The same SNMP model that has been used so far is also being used in many of these tools. You've got network automation tools like Puppet Chef Ansible. If you go Google it, you'll find Arista supports it, Cisco supports it, a bunch of other people support it. But they all support it with their own developed modules. Puppet, Chef, Ansible all have to work with the vendors to get those things going. That basically means you're always still held hostage to what the vendor wants. Tomorrow, today Ansible has gone to 2.0. You want to take those features because they are pretty cool? Guess what? You can't. 
Why? Because the modules have not been upgraded to work with Ansible 2.0. So you are constantly in this mode where your interest and your power is being controlled by the networking vendor rather than as it works in the compute world where you are very much in the control. It's an operator pull rather than a vendor push. And of course, both of them approach the development process in a radically different way. One works on code, the other works on paper. You have IETF, which is a very, very open process, or IEEE, which is a very open process, but anybody who's tried to push a draft through IETF knows what it means. First of all, you have to go talk to a bunch of people. They'll all come in and they'll say, well, if you want me to be an author, I'm gonna change a couple of bits here, and I want you to make this not an eight bit, I want it to be a 16 bit. Of course, you want authors, so you add them. And then this goes on, and by the time a draft is done and ready for even acceptance by the working group, it's quite a bit of time. Meanwhile, customers aren't sitting around trying to say, I don't have answers. They'll find patches, workarounds all the time, rather than trying to work and do things intelligently and in a thoughtful, simple way, they come up with complex solutions. And those complex solutions make networking a complex beast, which means more and more people are saying, oh, I need somebody who really knows how to type a line in that box because I don't know what that line does anymore because that line needs to go with 15 other lines and they're not necessarily well understood because the problem I want to solve is different. Today, for example, on the Twitter, there has been a talk about by Ivan Pepelniak, who's a pretty well-known blogger, talking about the fact that, okay, all the data plane discussions are done, but now we are going to be sitting and arguing about control planes. There are 15 different control plane answers which control plane are we going to support? The compute world doesn't worry about it. You have cluster protocols. You've got all kinds. You've got the raft consensus protocol. You've got the Paxos protocol. You've got Ganglia. You've got Collegdi. People just go work on it, have code out there. People who like it, pick it up and go do what they want with it. And there's always an active community and it's open source code. Whereas on the internet side, on the networking side, it's always draft driven. And that fundamentally means that you cannot have anything go happen. The other day we were pushing a small uh, little functionality that we added to BGP, which was to display the host name. Just send the host name across in the open message. We got more than 50 replies from people saying, this is a terrible idea. It's already been done. It's done with DNS. And then they were all coming from the operator service provider side. Then the next thing they came up with was, this is going to break all pieces of code because this is very complex. So we showed them, here is the Quagga patch. It's 10 lines. Can you comment on what part of it is hard? Everybody went quiet. And then five minutes later, uh, one more person, uh, Thomas Mangin, who runs, uh, who's written another open source uh, BGP tool called uh, uh, XRBGP, posted a patch saying like, yeah, it's pretty trivial. I patched it already and XRBGP has default hostname support. It is that trivial. But instead, you had to go through a long process of people saying why it's a bad idea and how you should use SNMP to actually get the host name and tie together 15 other things. And then after that, you had a whole bunch of people saying this won't work and that it's too complex. If you had code and you just showed it to them, all those arguments would stop. With paper, you can argue forever. I mean, we know that government runs large bureaucracies, corporations, large corporations run large bureaucracies with reams of paper, right? They have a paper for any problem that they don't want to solve. So does this all matter? So Google released TensorFlow, and what they said in the release of TensorFlow, and this is from their blog, is we hope that this will let the machine learning community exchange ideas much more quickly through working code than through academic research papers. It's well understood. This is not something that is unique to them. IETF's founding maxim was rough consensus working code, and now it is complete consensus and maybe a draft. And that's really bad for the networking world because nothing is happening. This is what, these are all the reasons why James Hamilton from Amazon said, networking is in my way to build Amazon's cloud. The other problem is how people construct these things. If you say, okay, now we got to do networking, fine. We have all understood, we want to do DevOps, we all have to do all of this, that's great. Now let's build the uniform data model. BGP has a model. And there is a model being done by I2RS. There is a model being done by NetConf, which to me is nothing but SNMP in XML. There is more people like this trying to build models. But 
that's not how the network, the compute community works. There are a whole bunch of different key, distributed key value stores. They're all accessible. They just work on structured I.O. Just give me JSON or some structured output and some way to give you a structured input. And I know how to deal with it. I don't have to worry, in fact, at the end, it's not that hard for me to deal with a couple of differences. Why build this myth of a uniform data model? Because first we will debate endlessly about this uniform data model, and after we are done, where do we end up? I have 10 new features that got developed while we were debating about this new model, and these 10 new features don't fit in the data model, so please walk my way for another proprietary answer to how to solve this problem. Read spits out a new version every time. No one is sitting and saying, by the way, where is the structured model for me to understand what your changes are? I want to have a structured model for how clusters work. There's no such thing in the compute world. But the myth of the uniform data model still runs the networking world. So what happened? What we were left with is sysadmins and network admins took separate ways. There was no happy ending. There is no happy ending in this. There is no path that was less trodden that everybody enjoyed and said, my life was made better because of this. Two paths diverged, and they diverged for the worse. Today morning, I was having a chat with uh, breakfast with John Willis, uh, who many of you might know as a DevOps guru, as somebody who is a legend in, his, uh, in the DevOps world. He was telling me, Dinesh, networking is easy. I have so many friends. I have enough gray hair that I have enough friends who know networking but who have just stopped putting networking on their resume anymore because they don't know how to do manage BGP on a Cisco box or an Arista box or on a Juniper box because they all come with so many intricacies and knobs that they don't know that they're not allowed to touch that box till you understand all of the intricacies. I don't care for those intricacies. I want to do something simple. Just let me do it. No, so we have had this shift and the shift has led to problems being solved twice and but in the data center especially, everything is a distributed application. If you look at Hadoop, it's as complicated an application as BGP or any of the others, far more complex potentially. And people deal with distributed applications in the compute world far more effectively. But in the networking world, oh my God, it's BGP. Before you touch anything, you gotta talk to me and not me being a whole room full of people. They even go through the process of convoluting the model so that Today, there, are, there is a draft, which is going to become an RFC soon, where they take the OSP of Stopoli information, stick it in BGP address family, just to shovel it in to get to another node. I mean, are you crazy? Why would you do these kinds of unnatural contortions? Because everything is driven by paper, by abstractions, and by black boxes. So, it's not just one of the fact that we can bemoan this, this has actually impact on all of us. Today morning, uh, Nicole presented a talk about DevOps and all the benefits that DevOps is giving, and she had some numbers there, like 150 times the improved reliability, uh, two and a half times the faster uh, release cycles uh, from peers who were doing DevOps to peers who were not. And the networking side is completely losing out on all of that. What's happened is you have siloed worlds today. And siloed worlds means finger pointing. The problem is in the application. The problem is in the networking. Why? As a networking guy, I can't log into the application because I have no clue, because all I'm used to is a CLI, and I have no, no knowledge about how the networking, the compute world works. The compute guy is not allowed to touch the network because they're completely different units. Even if he went in there, he wouldn't know what to do because the commands, the syntax, everything is archaic. I can't do for i is equal to one to 10, show me all the interface speeds, right? This lack of transparency hurts in our ability to be truly lean organization. And complexity, because every solution is solved twice, of course they're solved differently. Every solution is like uh, Leo Tolstoy's unhappy family. They're unhappy in their own way. They have their own idiosyncrasies and they just add to the complexity without adding to the value of the solution. And then of course the innovation is slowed dramatically because things move at the speed of the slowest link in the chain, which today is networking. Is there anything to be done about this? Isn't this just the way things were? Well, if you look at the compute world, it was that way not so long ago. For those of you who remember, there was Solaris. 
and there was HP UX, there was IBM's AIX. Every one of them did something differently. They also did their own processors, they built their own sheet metal, they built their own operating system. Yes, they were Unix, but I couldn't type LS minus AL on all of them and hope to make it work. And they followed the same track for a while. And then the Linux revolution happened, and all of that went away. I doubt if this, the innovation that we have today, the kinds of talks that fuel Lisa today would have happened had we continued the compute world down the same path that the networking world has been going down. You got all of this. You weren't stuck with SQL as your only answer to a database. When NoSQL came about, a lot of people were like, oh my God, what is this? The reason it happened is because people were free to innovate. They had a platform on which they could build real stuff, do real things, and actually show that it works. Whereas the networking world isn't that way. So one of the things that's happening in the networking world, for many of you who may not know enough about networking or who are not familiar with all the changes in the networking world, is the changes that happen to compute are also happening in the networking world. The move to disaggregate hardware from software to sell them each individually and to sell them separately without locking the two together and to treat the network operating system as a platform rather than as a black box has begun. It's more than begun. It's going on in its third or fourth year. SDN was the first attempt to do something like that, but SDN threw the baby out with the bathwater. You don't need to fix OSPF and BGP. When I went to a large web scale company in my previous life and OpenFlow had come out, and I asked them, they were like, oh, so what is your answer to OpenFlow? Why are you not giving us OpenFlow? We want OpenFlow tomorrow. So we said, OpenFlow sucks. It doesn't even have multipathing. You guys are running a large data center. Are you nuts? OpenFlow is a piece of crap. We will give you Cisco Flow. Way better. Does everything you guys want. Even toast your bread. They said, great. When you're done, come back. We'll apply the butter and jam and have a good meal. I said, so imagine you have it today. What are you going to do with it? And the answer was, oh, configure VLANs. You want OpenFlow to configure VLANs? I don't understand. And the guy said, Dinesh, I run 100,000 servers. No, pro no problem. I can't run 100 of your boxes. I need a programmatic way to access it. So SDN began with something that was simple and has gone into a completely different perspective right now in my mind. What people really need is the ability to reuse the tools that they already know, BGP and OSPF are not broken, push things up into the application, the way many of the large web scale companies are doing. But this transformation is already happening. There is already an ecosystem that is built around that. You've got from the switching silicon, to the hardware, to the network operating system, to the applications. All of these are already underway, and they are well in their, their mature products. We run in one of the largest data centers in the world. NDA prevents me from saying who, but as of reports last, we were running on over 20,000 switches in production. So when you look at all of this and you look at the application space at the top, for those of you who are in the compute world, many of those applications are things that you already know. Sensu, people know, Ansible, Puppet, Chef, Ganglia. Those are all things that you can use with networking equipment instead of saying, I cannot use them for networking, that east is east, west is west, and the twain shall never meet. That is no longer true. The change is beginning to happen. And Facebook launched the Open Compute Project Initiative, which essentially said, from now on, if you want to call yourself an open networking box, you will have to decide on some of these things. You will have to have these things work. And they have taken some of the technology that Cumulus did, but this is not to talk about Cumulus so much as to talk about the fact that there is consilience coming between networking and computing. And Linux as a network OS makes a lot of sense because Linux already has all the constructs necessary to make things work. Recently, patches from uh, us for VRF and MPLS were accepted into the Linux kernel, and so Linux 4.2 has MPLS and VRF support. People who are doing things like containers and VMs are already also interested in networking. Because remember, in the data center, everything is a distributed application. Networking matters to more than just the guys who run the networks. And so Linux has got a lot of eyeballs and active vendor-led development, our community-led development, 
to actually make it really robust. So Linux today, or at least in 2016, I pos uh, posit, will be at the same state that Linux and computing was maybe five, six years ago. I mean, all these arguments about, yeah, that's nice, but you can't run databases. Yeah, that's nice, but I wouldn't run mission-critical applications on them. All of that is gone. Linux, as a fundamental construct, works pretty well, and the kernel defines not only the API, but also the behavior. Most people just do APIs. They're interested in the APIs. The other thing that's going on, the flip side or the corollary of the myth of the uniform data model are APIs. You don't have to worry about APIs. The Linux kernel defines the API and the behavior. And this is the evolution of the network OS, right? We began a long time ago with a monolithic, mo monolithic OS which did not even have memory management. It was just one monolithic kernel. From there, we went to an embedded operating system, then to using Linux, but Linux only for its process and memory management, not for its networking. And now the time has come for with the open networking for things to also work with Linux, Linux being the entire stack. And so what's consilience? Consilience is an agreement between approaches on a topic among different academic subjects. So consilience between networking and computing means that solutions that you do once can be applied to both fields if they are applicable. You don't have to attempt to solve the problem two times. And if you think about what it means, it means that when you take Ansible or Puppet or Chef, you run them the way you run them on a compute server. You don't have to say, oh, I'm running Ansible on a networking box, so I have to set gather facts as false. Or with Puppet, I have to have a separate module. You look up the Puppet basic introduction or the Chef basic introduction, just go fire it off and that should also configure. Except that instead of configuring one interface, you'll configure a lot more interfaces. Instead of configuring Hadoop, you configure BGP. But other than that, it should work identically. And this means consistent tooling. I mean, think about what happened when voice over IP, the telephony network, and the data network all married, married and became one. Look at all the revolution that was unleashed because of that, all the changes that came about. All of that is possible because you got rid of two ways of thinking about the world. You got rid of two ways of dealing with the world, two different models of the world. You had a single uniform model. The same thing with networking and computing. Once you have consistent tooling, the way you validate your entire data center is now possible. It's not just validating the networking part or the uh, host part, or the, that is the compute part. You can validate everything. You can actually consistently look at across the data to figure out how do I gather data to figure out where the problem is in my box. And there is transparent, well-understood processes. We have people who understand Linux, general sysadmins, which means you have got people who understand networking as well as applications. That means nobody is afraid to reach across the table and type in a command to figure out what is going on or to deploy the same tools to get the same monitoring going on so that they can understand what's going on on a networking box just the way that they monitor and troubleshoot a compute box. And since you're solving the problem only once and you're solving it in the best way, you have the ability to not repeat solutions. You have the ability to simplify the world and faster innovation. As an example, today you can use Vagrant, Ansible, or replace it with Puppet or Chef, it doesn't matter, and Cumulus VX to build a complete data center on your laptop. I'll try and show you a demo after, if there is time after I'm done. But you can validate conf configuration uh, with server spec or behave. You can make changes and see the effects of those changes before you deploy them. When you have got version 2.5.4 and 2.5.3, you can test what the interop behavior is going to be before you push things out into the network. You can use Sensu or Console or CollectD and Ganglia to monitor all of these exactly the way you monitor compute. You can use Elk, Splunk. You can test all this on your laptop. You don't need to have a complete hard equipment with a complete data center to be able to test out everything. You can test hosts, you can test applications, you can test networking all on your laptop. And then use the same configuration and validation and troubleshooting to deploy your production network. So now you can push everything out, the same tools, the same scripts, the same playbooks, or the same recipes, you can push it out onto your real network. So this is not doing it once and then throwing it all away and repeating it else. So now when you think about continuous integration, when you think about uh, continuous validation, all of those things fall in not just for compute, but for computing and networking. 
And the first way of consilience is already upon us. No networking vendor today stands up and says, automation is bad. They all genuflux to automation one way or the other. They all attempt to provide some bash access just so you can type IP route and feel good about the fact that I'm running on a Linux box, even if that's all you can do. But all of them are genuflecting. And analysts are talking about this. Customers, we are deployed, like I said, in investment banks, police departments, marketing intelligence analysts, um, all kinds of different places. Suppliers, we, the supply chain is pretty robust now. You're no longer restricted to figuring out what the supply chain looks like. You've got a pretty robust, healthy supply chain. And I'm not talking about specifically when I talk about the analysts or suppliers, I'm not talking about Cumulus Linux. I'm talking about the open networking in general. And so summing up, consilience across computing and networking can speed up innovation. And open networking can speed up consilience. And that concludes my talk. I could give a demo. I could take some questions. Uh, either way. Sure. I believe, yeah. So I'm going to steal a phrase. Um, something you hear a lot is no one's ever been fired for choosing IBM. The same sort of thing applies with Cisco. Uh, yep. How, how does everything looks fantastic? Like this would be, if I could from Puppet or Chef or Salt configure switches, that would be awesome. But I don't see how it can reach a broader audience until Cisco supports it. How do you see a way forward past or around or through that? I think the same thing will happen, what happened with IBM, right? Nobody was fired for buying IBM, but in the end, IBM lost. And I think it's going to take a little while. But today, for your specific question of Puppet, Chef, and Ansible, they are all supported by Cisco, too. They have all agreed to work. So Puppet Labs, if you were in the uh, other talk that's running next door, Puppet has worked, Cisco's working with Puppet. And Puppet is working with Cisco to develop a standard networking model for all the traditional networking boxes. But again, it's a module that is specific to networking. It's not networking in general. So each vendor has their own version of that. So you have to troubleshoot not only the tool, you have to troubleshoot their version, and you have to troubleshoot the actual thing, as opposed to just troubleshooting one thing. So that's the first part. The second part of it is, the way forward is happening because one of the big factors with all of this is you can first test out your deployment, and when you look at the cost of buying what this takes, you can buy it with your credit card today. Whereas if you have to buy the equivalent with some of the larger vendors, and there are people here like Will who can testify to that, if you want to buy something like that, you got to sell your first and probably your second bond to slavery, right? Before you can get that to happen. So that's already happening. And everybody is making incremental steps because they understand that this has to change. So I think it's clear that there's a lot that the networking world needs to learn from the computing world. Um, but one of the things, when I talk to networking people about system management or network management kinds of issues, um, there are a lot more ways to shoot yourself in the foot on a network than there seem to be on systems, right? Particularly when you're trying to do remote management of, of <coughs> devices, right? And so, you know, anybody that's ever managed a networking device probably still has a stupid serial cable in their laptop bag, right? Um, and, and so, uh, I guess one of the, the areas that I think is going to be kind of difficult about this kind of approach is that you haven't had to harden those tools against these class of failures. And I think that that's awfully hard, right? Particularly when you have these dynamic autonomous protocols that are functioning under the covers to do things like, oh, suddenly spanning tree means that you can't talk to the device that you were trying to manage or things of that sort. And so I'm sort of curious what you think, uh, sort of convergence aside, what are the things that you think are missing that are gonna be required to, to implement this kind of model? So to your specific question, I could give you a theoretical answer, but the practical reality of it is the following. This very we have one very large customer, we have many large customers, but specifically one large customer who's running our code in production on over 20,000 switches. It's your traffic, something you're doing today is running over that network. So it's hardened a lot. It is not something that is not hardened. They are using SNMP to monitor some of the things. So you have the basic things going on, that's perfectly fine. The way you manage compute, you can manage this box again the same way. You don't have to have that serial console. 
one of the things that people have done, one of the, you are absolutely right, there are many ways in which I can shoot myself in the foot with networking than I can with compute. But a large re portion of, the, uh, of that reason has to do with the fact that I was busy battling standards and battling things, so what I did is I did patch after patch after patch after patch, and each patch is dependent on the previous patch, and if you don't know the right combination of patches and the commands to type, of course you'll shoot yourself in the foot. Is that a reason why networking is complex, or is it just the way that it was implemented that is complex? Right, so when I say that, what I mean is, so take as a simple example, BGP configuration. A lot of people say, oh, networking configuration is far more complex than uh, host configuration because I have to configure IP addresses at both ends of the link. And I have to make sure that the subnets are correct. I have to make sure of 15 other things. That's all false. They had to do it that way because they did not have proper cable management tools. Right? I don't know, how do I know if I'm supposed to be connected on port one to you, my port five is supposed to be connected to port one to you, how do people actually figure that out? The only way they had was they tried doing that with subnet management. That's not how the large vendors do it. And we, there is a tool that Cumulus Linux has that others have deployed it both on hosts and on the switches, which, and it's on GitHub, which will do cable management for you. All the tools are there. You know what to do, run LLDP and you know that you're connected to the right guy. Once I know I'm connected to the right guy, I don't need to assign IP addresses at every end and shoot myself in the foot. The second problem is a lot of people, and this is still uh, amazing to me that I'm talking about it in 2016. I, just the other day I had somebody stand up and say, but layer two is much faster than layer three. What world are you living in, right? <laughs> the ASICs that power your box do layer two and layer three at just the same speed. So stop showing your age. So the point is that, so people, to your point, so what ends up happening is in layer two, there is a whole set of brittle protocols and a lot of proprietary protocols developed that actually make what you say completely true, right? So the first thing you do is you say, no, I'm not going to do that. One of the things, so when people talk about automation, they talk about making networks, calm, why networking or automation is hard, one of the first things you realize is when I'm building a network or when I'm building a compute, I make each node look exactly like the other. That's called substitutability. They all run the same version of the Linux kernel. I don't run one version on this, another version on this, and by the way, on this I type a separate set of commands, or on this I type a separate set of commands, right? When you're used to manually typing everything and managing a few boxes, it's easy to be lazy and make those assumptions and say that each box is done differently and therefore it is hard. Whereas I can show you, and we can have the demo, I can show you that with just a single Ansible playbook, <clears throat> You can configure a clause, an N by N clause, with layer two uh, or layer three, with dual attached hosts or single attached hosts, right? It's possible, as long as you say, I'm willing to simplify my network. If you say I need every one of the knobs, as a simple example, there are like 15 different knobs for handling unidirectional link detection. Unidirectional link detection is built into the 10 gigabit ethernet standard. It is, there are standards, if you run, enable a st standard st a spanning tree protocol with bridge assurance, it works. But vendors don't tell you that. And so what you end up doing is, I have to support UDLD. So now how does UDLD work? Well, you have to be a CCIE to understand that because that's a proprietary protocol. That's what makes it. So if you actually sit down and break it apart, you find that networking isn't that hard at all. You can't really shoot yourself in the foot that much more easily than with compute. You have to have a different skill set. You need to think a little differently, but that's the same to me as if you're running Hadoop versus if you're running Oracle database. You need a slightly different mindset and how you think about it. So do you think that that's going to mean that we end up with simpler networking protocols over time? Pardon? Or do you think that that's going to be reflected in the networking protocol space over time? I think oh, completely. So if you take a look at the data center today, while OSPF is around, most people just deploy BGP because BGP is simple. It just works, it's multi-protocol, which means I don't have to have a family for V3, V IPv4 and IPv6, I just run one, and when V6 is ready, I just enable it and I'm done. So that'll come down. Now think about the discussion that we were talking about, right, VXLAN. So VXLAN is there, I want to distribute MAC addresses everywhere. So now we are sitting and having this debate about what protocol. Imagine the model of virtual networking that is an overlay applied to control protocols. You have BGP, which builds the entire networking connectivity, run a distributed key value store and exchange your key values. Don't talk to any vendor. Why do you need to talk to a vendor? 
right? You can distribute this information. This is simple enough that you can actually get it to work. But people won't do that because, oh, 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 wait, let me tell you 15 problems that will happen. This is exactly like the BGP default host name, right? Show me the host name. Well, there are 15 problems. Okay, let's sit down and break them. I don't have the time. So to your points, first, I don't think networking is harder to troubleshoot or shoot yourself in the foot. It has been made that way because of the way things have evolved on the networking world. The second, the tools that you want to use are already very hardened because they are being used in production in web scale companies, in police departments, financial customers. You pick your particular field and it's being used. So this is already battle hardened. If you want the exact same tool, for example, TACAX. I want TACAX. Well, TACAX is a Cisco proprietary thing that you want to heard. use and mod it. If you run LDAP, it's fine. I'm not sure I've ever heard anybody say, I want TACAX. <laughs> you come to, come to my life. <laughs> 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 Welcome to my life. But anyway, I think many people are realizing that and moving on. But I think that is the whole point, right? I mean, I think. To be fair, I don't know how much of it is also driven by the fact that, look, I have a particular uh, certification. That certification enables me to do things that prevents you from having to do it. Because then if you can do it, then why did I get that certification? So if I can make it a little more complicated, then you won't understand it. You'll always need me. But I don't think all of that is required. And I can show you something, for example, people, the next thing, and this comes up just like the layer two argument. Oh, if you do unnumbered interfaces and you don't assign IP addresses, how can you trace route? You cannot trace route anything. And just since you are on, I'm sorry if I'm taking up more of your time than you want to. I don't know if you're uncomfortable standing on the, in the limelight, but let's just take a simple box like this. So this is a vagrant, this is an N by M clause. And if you look at the IP route, you see that that's the routing stack. If you look at, sorry, and there's no multipathing enabled because I was trying to illustrate something to someone else. So if you look at the addresses, none of the, all of the links have the same IP address, which is essentially their loopback IP address, nothing more. So let's assume that I want to do trace route. Right? You get this. What did I type? One, sorry. Not one. Two. You get this. And people say, well, this is what you get. Now, if I had actually numbered the interfaces and stuck everything into DNS, I would actually get everything working. OK, so let's actually solve that problem. You not only get interfaces, you also get everything, you know what interface you're going out of, what interface you're going in on. You get everything. And I did all this without touching a single line of production code. It's all done with open source tools. No DNS involved. And the reason I can do this is I can take advantage of the compute tools that a traditional networking vendor cannot. So my point to you is that, so another example, People say, oh, you know, a single pane of glass. One of the things that's very important is the central control with a single pane of glass. OK, I give you a single pane of glass. You can view, for example, these are the different switches. You can say, OK, on the other switch, show me the BGP summary. This is the BGP summary on that box. Show me the IP addresses on that box. I can't see what I'm typing. IP route on that box, right? This is the IP route on that box. You can get, and I'm done all of this, like I said again, without touching a single line of code on Cumulus shipping production. This works with some of our older software too, and using all open source tools. It just requires you, and this is battle hardened because it uses tools that many of you already use probably. It's not something that I wrote on my own private time. So my point to you is that many of these things are no longer true simply because consilience means you can take those battle-hardened tools that you know and deploy them here. But you can't today because the vendor needs to push that. And the consilience is the ability to not require that anymore. Have I made my case? <laughs> I think 
So I mean, I, I tend to think of, of networks as being really complicated to interact with because the model for them basically can't be shoehorned into a hierarchical. No. Kind. I mean, it, if you end up with a, a, a network with lots of path diversity. Pardon? If you end up with a network with lots of path diversity, to like say multi-path in a, in a yeah. class like what you're a talking class, about. Yeah, a class, yeah. Then, then things get a little more complicated. Right? Can I, you can, and we can do this offline too, but you can see that when you look at this configuration with BGP or with OSPF, it looks the same box after box after box after box. There is no difference. And that is where, but I can make it complex. I can. I'm not saying that I cannot make it more complex. I can make it complex, but just because I can doesn't mean I want to. The real question is if you need to. That's, that's the yeah, thing that I'm and trying to work so through this, that, right? so the proof again is not that this is a toy. This is again the way the large companies are deploying, and some of the smaller companies too. We have got uh, companies like Medallia who are public customers. They are, they, I can quote them by name because they are on our website giving talking about us. They have all of this working in exactly this manner. They have like 16 or 30. They have a small number of it. They are not a web scale company. So they have it working today, and they've been working for the last two years. So I managed to throw in a demo and a answer a question, hopefully. <laughs> Any further questions, comments? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>